you're watching Aussie Indian. In our last segment, we brought you a very special interview with Pinky Butler, who shared her story with us and her work with the Harmon Foundation. And in this segment, we're going to be speaking with Monica Lay, who holds a degree in psychology and is also a domestic violence case manager. Thank you so much for joining us, Monica. Thank you for having me. It's lovely to have you on the show. Thank you for taking the time out to speak with us today. It's great to be here. So um, is it fair to say that there is a stigma around um, victims of family violence uh, within the Indian Australian community? Um, and how can we as a community or members of the community work to change that? Yeah, I think that would be a very fair statement. Yeah. Um, but first of all, I would like to qualify that statement yeah. and just say that domestic violence and family violence is widespread across all cultures yeah the entire world yes yeah. um so it's not anything particularly about indian culture that is of bad course. yeah um because you know there as i said domestic violence is yeah widespread yeah, every culture mm -hmm. every religion every yeah. ethnicity um it is unfortunately there yeah um having said that in the indian community um i would say that there are additional um issues that cause an added level of stigma yeah. um, around DV victims. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would say that it's probably largely due to um, a stronger adherence to gender roles. Yeah. Um, like okay. the traditional gender roles. Yeah. So, um, I appreciate that. Yeah, I'll give mm. you an example of like the, f the okay. female side because, yeah. um, as you're probably aware, most domestic violence victims are female. Yeah. Um, so, in terms of traditional gender roles, um, the typical Indian girl, mm -hmm. um, and I say Indian just because yeah. um, of the context, but this is the same in many multicultural groups, mm -hmm. where the typical young girl will grow up exposed to stereotypes and expectations mm -hmm. where um, she'll be expected to, um, to be accommodating and yeah. agreeable and always smile and um, be ready to give everyone a kiss when they when she arrives at a guest's house mm -hmm. and um, to always be compliant with whatever is yeah. asked of her. Um, so she grows up and the stories that she's hearing is you're going to get married and find a man that will take care of you yeah. and then you will be happy mm. and you'll become a mother and your life will be complete. And yeah. that's the goal that is set for these little girls. So they grow up thinking, yes, that's what I'm going to grow up and do. And then they get into a relationship Unfortunately, sometimes one where um, it is more conducive to domestic violence mm. with these expectations of, yes, I'm now going to be happy and devote my entire life to this man and form my entire identity around being a wife and a mother mm -hmm. so that when domestic violence occurs, it's so difficult for her to leave because she doesn't have anything else. Yeah. that she's built for herself. Mm -hmm. All of her life's goals, ever since she was a little child, has been to become that mother, yeah. that wife. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, jeopardizing that because like even thinking about having to leave her husband, yeah. um, that, that's a lot for an individual to handle. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, so in addition to those gender roles which are so entrenched in the little girl who grows up to be that woman who's stuck in an abusive relationship, mm around her, her own family, are also buying into these traditional gender mm. roles. So when she decides to leave the marriage, um, if she decides to leave the marriage, often these Indian women are being blamed. Mm. So this victim blaming is yeah. so rampant <clears throat> where it's it's often perceived as this woman is choosing to rock the boat and disturb mm. the peace and yeah. put her own needs, her selfishness, before her, those of her children and her husband, mm -hmm. um, which is such a shame because um, research has shown that obviously when a parent is does not have the mental health um, and is not provided with basic human rights, yeah. their ability to parent and to be in a role model for children just completely goes out the window. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of these women, they are mis misinformed as to what the best way to be a good mother in yeah. that situation is. Yeah. Um, and it is to get help and leave the abuse. That is what's best for the children. Mm. But of course, that's not the message that is shared amongst the Indian community. Yeah. In the mm -hmm. Indian community, it's often the message that in a family, if there's domestic violence, it's their business. Mm -hmm. The woman's 
job is to stay with her husband, be a dutiful wife, put the needs of her children and the husband before her own. And if she complains or if she um, brings negative attention to her family, then it's, it's almost a disgrace. It's a shameful thing that she's doing to her family. Um, so I've encountered quite a few cases where, you know, clients have told me that the reason why they have stayed with their abusive partner was because their own parents said that they had to. Oh. So, and this is in the face of severe physical, emotional, sexual violence, um, where children have witnessed this abuse in the home, um, and and the woman's parents themselves because they buy in so heavily to these traditional gender roles, they can't even support their daughter and say, yes, you need mm -hmm. to leave and put your safety and the, the safety of your children first. Terribly sad. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so yeah. Um, a lot of the clients that I do work with, um, either they have just moved into Australia because yeah. they're on a spousal visa, yeah. um, or families that have just moved across as a family unit. Yeah, okay. And so, um, yeah, it can be difficult for yeah. them to um, settle yeah. in New South Wales, mm. in Australia, um, especially with their language barriers. Yeah. Um, culture shock yeah. is very real. Yeah. Um, so it is really helpful that there are these services that are culture specific and yeah. catering to culturally and linguistically diverse yeah. individuals. Um, because I think it is a really important part of their service delivery that yep. they are accessing within the wider mainstream yeah. services. Okay. And there are many domestic violence um, advocacy groups, sorry, who are voicing loudly that the government um, needs to offer more support. Um, what do you think about this? And do you think, especially with um, now, because of COVID-19 as a result um, of this pandemic and because of the restrictions that recently came about, um, are those temporary migrants more vulnerable? What are the statistics? How do they compare to pre-pandemic life? Yeah, um, I think it's safe to say that there has been a surge in domestic violence, domestic and mm. family violence, I should yeah. say. Um, unfortunately, um, you know, it's like a perfect storm where yeah. with COVID, um, people were having to socially isolate. So they were mm. stuck in the homes. Yeah. So that means that pre-existing cases of domestic and family violence were amplified, mm. where victims were stuck, physically stuck indoors mm. with their perpetrators. Yeah. Um, so that, you know, previously when social isolation wasn't, mm -hmm. um, wasn't happening, victims would maybe get a few hours at least to themselves during okay. the day. But with COVID restrictions, that's, it's just been 24 hours being stuck in that abusive environment. Mm. Um, and, you know, in addition to that, there's been loss of employment. So we've seen alcoholism rising, um, as well as the stress and the, uh, the decrease in quality of life that comes with social isolation and the, all the pressures of being in a pandemic um, and having the kids at home as well and having mm. to homeschool. Yeah. Um, it is a perfect storm where, you know, perpetrators are going to have more on their plates. They're going to be more stressed. And so unfortunately that is going to make the domestic violence worse and yep. victims are having to bear the brunt of that. It's so um, school, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah, and so we have seen an increase mm -hmm. in the um, in the services that are accessed. Yeah. So I think one eight hundred respect. Yeah. Um, calls have I don't know the online tool has okay. been seen an increase in thirty eight percent. Wow. Since the beginning of the pandemic, um, and I know research right. from the UN has estimated an increase in fifteen million cases of domestic violence. Fifteen million yeah. worldwide. Um, in relation to COVID. And it's not only because of all the factors that I said, the perfect storm, but it's also because um, there's been a lot of disruption to um, violence prevention services across the entire globe. And so that means that these cases that may have been prevented from going into full-blown domestic violence, that the services weren't being accessed because yeah. they were closed. And so they are unfortunately progressing to that stage. So I'd say that the ramifications of COVID have been immense, unfortunately, mm -hmm. on domestic and family violence. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's, it's going to take a lot of collaboration and hard work from yeah. everyone in the entire community, not just those working on the front line, okay. to <clears throat> yeah, really support the domestic violence victims that will 
hopefully slowly come forward yeah or if not at least secretly be accessing these services yeah. in their own way that they are comfortable right and in effect um services i guess available also to the perpetrators yeah, yeah. okay yeah.